Here I want to present a very interesting property of matrices as well as an example of this property in action and what it means for one of my favorite topics, which is Lie algebras. Okay, so let's look at the property first. So if we take a matrix A, so it's any square matrix. So I've written it as any N by N matrix. And we do one of two things to it. We first exponentiate the matrix. And so exponentiating the matrix can be defined via the power series for E to the X and then take the determinant. So in other words, we take the determinant of the matrix exponential. So that should give us a number or we find the trace of the matrix. So just recall that the trace is the sum of the diagonal entries. So that also gives us a number. And if we exponentiate that number, we get the same thing as taking the determinant of that exponentiated matrix. So we've got some sort of commutative type diagram involving the determinant and the exponential. So I think that's pretty interesting. So let's do a full worked example of this in action. And then we'll prove this formula in general for a special class of matrices. But that class of matrices will be fairly broad. Okay, so I've built a matrix. So I think this example works out nicely with this matrix. So it is two by two, entries four, one, two, five. Okay, so we want to do two things. We want to find this exponential of our matrix and then find its determinant, or we want to find the trace and exponentiate that. Well, let's maybe go ahead and exponentiate the trace first because that's quite simple. Maybe I'll put that in this pink box. So let's notice that the trace of A, like I said, that's just the sum of the diagonal entries. So that's four plus five, so the trace is nine. So that means the exponential of the trace is e to the nine. Okay, so good, that was fairly simple. We calculated the left-hand side of this boxed equation. Now let's get to calculating the right-hand side, which is quite a bit more involved. Although if you've taken linear algebra, it shouldn't be that bad. So we'll start by finding the eigenvectors and eigenvalues for A. That's because we want to diagonalize A. That will make finding the matrix exponential quite a bit easier. Okay, so in order to find the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, we probably want to start with something called the characteristic polynomial. So that's the determinant of the matrix A minus X times the identity matrix. So in this case, this is the determinant of 4 minus x, 1, 2, 5 minus x. Because the identity matrix is just a matrix with ones on the diagonal. If we subtract x from all of the di diagonal entries, we get that over there. Okay, now let's recall the formula for a 2 by 2 determinant. It's the product of the diagonals, the product of the off diagonals, and then the difference so in this case, it's 4 minus x times 5 minus x minus 2. Okay, we can multiply that out pretty easily, and we'll get x squared minus 9x plus 18. So that's fairly simple, like symbolic manipulation. That factors pretty nicely as x minus 3 times x minus 6. So that means we've got two eigenvalues, and those eigenvalues are, I'll call them lambda one, which is three, and then lambda two, which is six. So let's box those so we can keep them for later. Now let's find the corresponding eigenvectors. That means we need to find the eigenspace associated to lambda one and the eigenspace associated to lambda two. But let's recall that's equivalent to finding the null space of our matrix minus these eigenvalues multiplied by the identity matrix. So in this case, if we want to find it for eigenvalue lambda one, we'll do the null space of a minus lambda one i, but recall lambda one is equal to three, so we can easily perform that calculation. We can use this written matrix here just to do it very quickly. So that's going to be equal to the null space of, well, let's see, we'll have four minus 
three, which is one, one, two, and then five minus three, which is two. So we have the null space of that. But let's recall the null space does not change if we perform row reduction to reduced echelon form. So we can do a row operation to get this to look like the matrix one, one, zero, zero. Okay, but now we wanna look at what would it take to be in the null space of this matrix? Well, let's say we've got a vector, which I'll say has entries X1 and X2, and it is in the null space of this matrix. That means if we multiply this matrix to this vector, we get the zero vector. That's the definition of being in the null space. But that very quickly gives us the equation x1 plus x2 is equal to zero. In other words, x1 is equal to negative x2. Okay, nice. But we've got a free variable there, which makes sense because the null space is a linear subspace, which means we should be able to take the span of whatever vector we get here. We might as well take x2 to be equal to negative one, that means x1 will be equal to positive 1, and that will give us an eigenvector, which I'll call v1, which is equal to 1 minus 1. Okay, so now let's maybe box that right here, and that is the eigenvector associated with eigenvalue 3. Okay, so maybe I won't do the calculation for our eigenvector associated with lambda 2, in other words, eigenvalue 6, but it follows essentially the same process. Actually, exactly the same process. Okay, so that being said, let's jump to the next board where we will have our eigenvalues and our eigenvectors. Okay, so I've collected what we had on the last board into the following eigen system. So we've got eigenvalue 3 and eigenvector 1 minus 1, eigenvalue 6 and eigenvector 1, 2. We didn't directly calculate this eigenvector. I'm leaving that as homework, if you will. Okay, so out of this eigen system, we know what the diagonal form of this matrix is, and we know the diagonalizing matrix. So I'll call that diagonally, di diagonalizing matrix P, which is pretty standard notation for this. And that will be the matrix whose columns are made up of the eigenvectors of our original matrix. So this actually changes the basis of this matrix from the standard basis to a diagonal matrix. Essentially, you're just looking at another form of the linear transformation represented by this matrix. Okay, anyway, so this is going to be 1 minus 1 and then 1, 2. That will be our diagonalizing matrix. We'll also need P inverse. And then luckily to find P inverse, there's a fairly standard trick using a 2 by 2 matrix. So P inverse will be 1 over the determinant. Let's notice that the determinant is 2 minus negative 1, so that is 3. So we have 1 over 3. And then we swap the diagonals, that'll give us 2, 1, and then negate the off diagonals. So that'll give us negative 1 and 1 swapped, really. But that's just because of the structure of this negation here. And then we know from linear algebra that P inverse AP is the diagonal matrix with entries given by these eigenvalues. So it's 3, 0, 0, 6. Next, we can invert this equation to tell us that A is equal to P3006 zero, zero, times P inverse. But we're actually gonna need a slightly more general version of this. We need A to the N, and that's because we're trying to calculate the matrix exponential here. But notice if we multiply A by A, we will have P, times this diagonal times P inverse, another P, the diagonal, and then P inverse, those middle P, P inverse pairs will cancel. And inductively, that will happen for all higher powers. So that means if I put an N here, all I have to do is put an N on this middle matrix. Again, because we end up with P, P inverse pairs in between every multiplication. But then, Finding a power of a diagonal matrix is as easy as exponentiating what's happening on the inside. So we get 3 to the n, 6 to the n on the inside. 
Nice. Now we're ready to calculate our matrix exponential. So I'll write it like this. We have e to the a is equal to the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of 1 over n factorial times a to the n. But we just calculated a to the n to be this object over here. So that's going to be equal to p, the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. 3 to the n, 0, 0, 6 to the n, and then a p inverse. Let's just make sure and notice that that p, p inverse are hugging this entire sum. We factored it out of every term here. Next up, we can notice the sum can easily be brought in to both of these entries within our matrix, but that just gives us the scalar formula for the exponential. So in other words, we end with p, e cubed 0 0 e to the 6 p inverse. So that's good to see. All right, so now let's bring this version of e to the a over here and then we'll calculate maybe a form that does not include the p's where everything is smashed together. So on the last board we landed at this spot e to the a was p this diagonal matrix p inverse and now we're ready to make this calculation. So let's recall that P was this matrix, so I'll write this as 1, negative 1, 1, 2, and then we have E cubed 0, 0, E to the 6, and then P inverse, which I'll just leave as is. So now we'll do this matrix product here. We can do this maybe in any grouping that we'd like because matrix multiplication is associative. So let's see what that'll leave us with. That's E cubed in our upper left entry. Then we have e to the 6 in our upper right entry. We have negative e cubed here. And then finally we have 2 e to the 6 here. Then that's multiplied by p inverse. So let's take that p inverse, factor the 1 third, which exists as part of p inverse, out to the front. We can do that because it's a scalar. And then we'll have this is multiplied by 2 minus 1, 1, 1. Okay, now let's bring that over and then we'll finally get a closed form for the exponential e to the a. So on the last board we had this expression for our matrix exponential e to the a. Now we're ready to do our final matrix product. So this is one third. Then let's see what the upper left entry is. It will be 2e cubed plus e to the 6. So 2e cubed plus e to the 6. Then our upper right entry will be e cubed minus e to the 6. Nice. And then here we will have 2e cubed, negative 2e cubed minus 2e to the 6, or plus 2e to the 6. So let's see. Minus 2e cubed plus 2e to the 6. Then finally over here we'll have e cubed plus 2e to the 6. So there, we've got a nice closed form for our matrix exponential e to the a. Okay, so now let's maybe bring that up and then we're actually almost ready to finish this off. So on the last board, we ended up with the following closed form for our matrix exponential. Now we want to find the determinant just to test this equation over here. So let's do that. So the determinant of e to the a. So we've got the scalar multiple of one third out here. And what does the scalar multiple do to the determinant? Well, it gives you a multiplier on the determinant, but that multiplier is raised to the size of the matrix. So instead of a one third, we'll have a one third squared or a one ninth. So I'm going to write this as one ninth. And now we can do the standard rule for a two by two determinant. So the product of the diagonals minus the product of the off diagonals. So we have two e cubed plus e six, e cubed plus two e six minus e cubed minus e to the sixth. I'm actually going to take that and turn it into a plus by factoring this minus out and having it cancel the minus that's inside of the multiplication or inside of the determinant formula. And then finally here we have minus 2e cubed plus 2e to the sixth. All right, so we've got some calculation to do. So let's see, we have 1 ninth, then multiplying this through, we have 2e to the 6 from this term, and then we have plus 4e to the 
9 from this term, so that outer terms, and then another e to the 9 from this term right here, and then finally a plus 2e to the 12. Okay, so let's just reiterate that is from this product. Now we need to add that to doing a similar thing over there. So let's see, we will have a minus 2e to the 6, so that would be the first terms, and then plus 2e to the 9, and then plus another 2e to the 9. So those are for the outer and the inner terms, I guess. And then finally, a minus 2e to the 12. Okay, so just to reiterate, that is from multiplying out these last two terms like this. Now let's see what kind of stuff cancels. Well, notice this 2e to the 6 and that minus 2e to the 6 will cancel. So that's good. And then this 2e to the 12 and that minus 2e to the 12 also cancel. And then we've got a bunch of e to the 9 terms. How many do we have? Well, 4 plus 1 plus 2 plus 2, so that is 9. Well, that multiplies to the 1 9th just to give us e to the 9. But let's notice that e to the 9 is exactly the exponential of the trace of a as we calculated way earlier in the video over there. Okay, so we showed this property holds for our example. Now I want to sketch what's going on in the background and then we'll look at how it applies to something in Lie theory. Let's do a little bit of a sketch of what's going on in the background. So the trace of a is in fact the sum of the eigenvalues of a. And then the determinant of a is the product of the eigenvalues of a. So that means if lambda is an eigenvalue of a, then e to the lambda is an eigenvalue of e to the a, and vice versa. So, so these three facts together will quickly prove the following formula. Because, notice if we're taking the determinant of e to the a, well that's going to be e to the lambda 1 times e to the lambda 2 times e to the lambda 3 and so on and so forth, which is e to the lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 using a multiplication rule for exponentials. And then since the trace is the sum of the diagonals, that's exactly what we have over here. Okay, so these three facts take us to this boxed equation pretty quickly. Now, how do you prove these three facts? Well, it's gen in general, it's a little bit tricky, but for diagonalizable matrices, it's not too bad. Although we will use the following fact in the background, that the trace of xy is the same thing as the trace of yx. I'll let you guys check that. You can do it just with the definition of matrix multiplication. It's not that bad. Okay, so let's suppose that A is diagonalizable and it's diagonalizable by the matrix P and we know its eigenvalues. So I'll just write it as P inverse AP is equal to this diagonal matrix lambda 1 all the way down to lambda N. So that's our diagonal matrix. Okay, nice. Now we can take the trace of A and notice that the trace of A will be the same thing as the trace of P times this diagonal matrix times P inverse, where all we've done there is inverted this equation. But next, because of this commutativity rule involving the trace, we can move this P past this diagonal diagonal matrix. Notice that does not create the same matrix, but it does create the same trace. But if we do that, the P and the P inverse will cancel. So that means we're just left with the trace of this diagonal matrix, which is lambda 1 plus all the way up to lambda n. Now, putting this all together, we see that e to the trace a is the same thing as e to the lambda 1 plus all the way up to lambda n, which is e to the lambda 1 times all the way up to e to the lambda n. So now keeping that in mind, we can calculate this other side, this determinant side, in parallel. So let's do that. Okay, we just argued that e to the trace of a was e to the lambda 1 times e to the lambda 2 all the way up to e to the lambda n.
Now I've inverted this diagonalizing equation to solve for a, and now we're ready to exponentiate a. So notice that e to the a following essentially the same thing we did with our example, just slightly more generalized, will be equal to P times the matrix E to the lambda one, all the way down to E to the lambda N, P inverse, where that is a diagonal matrix. Next, we can take the determinant of E to the A, and keep in mind that the determinant is multiplicative, so that gives us the determinant of P, times the determinant of this diagonal matrix. The determinant of that diagonal matrix is exactly the product of what's going on in the diagonals. So that'll be E1 up to e, e to the lambda 1 all the way up to E to the lambda n. And then we have the determinant of P inverse. But now we're just working with numbers. So multiplication of numbers is commutative. We can move this and multiply it to that and we'll get the determinant of the identity, which is just one, that cancels down. Now compare this determinant of e to the a with this e to the trace of a and see that we have the same thing in the special case where it is diagonal. So in the more general case, it's a little bit tricky and involves the Jordan canonical form, which would take a while to get into. Okay, so we're going to finish this off by looking at what it says about the Lie group SLN and its Lie algebra. Okay, as promised, we're going to finish talking a little bit about Lie groups and Lie algebras. So let's consider the very important Lie group SLNC. So that's the group of n by n matrices with entries in C. I will call them capital X, such that they have determinant of 1. So that's, those have an associated Lie algebra of S L little n C. So those are all n by n matrices with trace zero. So for example, the following matrix is trace zero. So negative two, three, four, two. So that means it's in the Lie algebra S L two. Okay, so now let's maybe notice something really interesting. If X is in, S, L, N, C. So in other words, it's an N by N matrix with trace zero. Let's look at E to the X. So let's set capital X equal to E to the little x. Now here I'm using this lowercase letter to say that we're in the Lie algebra. This uppercase letter will be reserved for being in the Lie group. So this is an N by N matrix. Now let's calculate the determinant of capital X. Notice that is the determinant of the matrix exponential little x. But by our formula over here, that is E to the trace of little x. But since little x is, is, is in SLNC, that means the trace of little x is zero. We get E to the zero, which is one. But that's exactly what we need for X, capital X that is, to be in SLNC. So this matrix exponential type formula here is like a pathway from the Lie algebra to the Lie group. Okay, so let's finish this off with a little picture of that situation. So here's a little bit of a picture of what was going on on the last board. So a Lie group is any group that also has a manifold structure. So here I've drawn this nice two-hold torus to represent the Lie group SLN. So this is definitely a simplification of the group, but at least it gets you thinking about the shape of a group as some sort of surface. So in general, that would be a group G. Okay, and then what is the Lie algebra associated to the group? Well, that is the tangent space at the identity. So the identity in SLN is the identity matrix over here, which I've called I sub N. And this yellow thing is a tangent plane to this surface. Well, I say tangent plane, but really it's higher dimensional that, than that. That's the tangent space to this torus shape at that identity element. So you call that this fancy G or little s l n. And then what is that matrix exponential map doing? Well, it's taking an element from this tangent space, like here x, and it's mapping it into the manifold, in other words, into the Lie group. So if x is in the tangent space, e to the x is in the group. 
Similarly, y could be in the group as well. And now notice, we've got an obvious group operation within the group, you know, matrix multiplication in this case. And you might say, well, do we have an obvious operation within the Lie algebra? And we do, and it's called the Lie bracket. So we're able to combine x and y into something called the bracket of x and y. And that is also mapped to something over here in the Lie group that's related to these two elements. But that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I'm actually going to do a big live stream at the end of the semester. So it's mostly a challenge just for myself to see how it goes. That's all about Lie algebras. So keep an eye out for that. And that's a good place to stop.